Family Theater presents Gene Raymond, Wendell Corey, and Tom Tully. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Wendell Corey and Gene Raymond in William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. To introduce the drama, your host and narrator, Tom Tully. Thank you, Gene Baker. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Tonight, Family Theater takes great pleasure in presenting William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, starring Wendell Corey as Mark Antony, and Gene Raymond as Brutus. How shall we know a man? By his deeds? History says there goes a conqueror, or perhaps there goes a god. Julius Caesar was labeled both of these, and sometime tyrant, too, by his enemies and even by his friends. Brutus was Caesar's friend, but so disturbed was he where Caesar's power might lead Caesar that he joined the conspiracy which struck Caesar down. History must call Brutus an assassin. Yet this was the man of whom his enemy Mark Antony was to say, This was the noblest Roman of them all. <laughs> Roman sun shines down upon a holiday. Caesar has returned in triumph from Munda in Spain, where he has crushed in conclusive battle the sons of Pompeii. His frowning white statues are hung with colored scarves and have been bedecked with badges by an adoring populace. Caesar has come home, and the mob is wild with joy. Their adulation reaches such a fever pitch that Brutus, Caesar's friend, is moved to whisper worriedly. What means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king. The wily Cassius, Caesar's enemy, takes advantage of this doubt. Aye, do you fear it? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius. Yet I love him well. Why, man? He doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus. And we, petty men, walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Ye gods, it doth amaze me. A man of such temper should... Hark! The games are done and Caesar is returning. Antonius, Caesar, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep o' nights. Young Cassius hath a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well-given. Would he were fatter, but I fear him not. Yet if my name were liable to fear, I do not know the man I should avoid so soon as that spare Cassius. Caesar! Huh? Who calls? Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music, cries Caesar. Speak! Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March! What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me and let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. Huh. He's a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass! Brutus, as they pass by, pluck Casca by the sleeve, and he will, after his sour fashion, tell you what hath proceeded were they note today. I will do so. You pulled me by the cloak. Would you speak with me? Aye, Casca. Tell us what has chanced today that Caesar looks so sad. Why, there was a crown offered him, and being offered him, he put it by with the back of his hand. Thus. And the people fell a-shouting. Who offered him the crown? Why, Antony. 
I saw Mark Antony offer him a crown, and and he put it by. Heard you that, Cassius? Caesar put it by. But for all that, to my thinking, he would fain have had it. <laughs> and then Antony uh, offered it to him again, and then he put it by again. But to my thinking, he was very loath to lay his fingers off it. And then Antony offered it the third time. Was the crown offered him thrice? Aye, yes. He put it the third time by. And after that, he came thus sad away. Aye, yeah, he did. Yeah, fare you well. There was more foolery yet, if I could remember it. You dine with me tomorrow, Casca. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. Brutus and Caesar. What should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? Write them together, yours is as fair a name. Sound them, it doth become the mouth as well. Weigh them, tis as heavy. Conjure with them. Brutus will start a spirit as soon as Caesar. Now in the names of all the gods at once, upon what meat doth this our Caesar feed that he has grown so great? Aye, so it is. For this time I will leave you. Tomorrow, if you please, to speak with me, come home to me, and I will wait for you. I will do so. Till then, think of the world. Well, Brutus, thou art noble, yet I see thy honorable metal may be wrought from that it is disposed. For who so firm that cannot be seduced? <laughs> Never knew the heavens menace so. You are dull, Casca. You look pale and gaze. Put on fear and cast yourself in wonder to see the strange impatience of the heavens. Now could I, Casca, name to thee a man most like this dreadful night that thunders, lightens, open graves and roars as doth the lion in the capital? Yeah, it is Caesar that you mean, is it not, Cassius? Indeed, they say the senators tomorrow mean to establish Caesar as a king. Now know you, Casca that I have moved already some certain of the noblest-minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honorable, dangerous consequence. And the complexion of the element in favor is like the work we have in hand, most bloody, fiery, and most terrible. <laughs> Since Cassius first did wet me against Caesar, I have not slept. Between the acting of a dreadful thing and the first motion, all the interim is like a phantasma or a hideous dream. It must be by his death, and for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him. But for the general, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. Crown him. That? And then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. And therefore, think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched, would as his kind grow mischievous. Then kill him in the shell. <laughs> And so, with fear of Caesar's harm, not that it had been done, but that were only possible, noble Brutus gave his scruples over to the wily Cassius. But even as the terrible alliance formed around him, Brutus insisted on its lofty purpose. The others, being lesser men, became excited at the scent of blood. Basely were they stirred by the morrow's work. Assassination! Shall no man else be touched but only Caesar? Decius, well urged. I think it is not meet Mark Antony, so well beloved of Caesar, should outlive Caesar. Our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then hack the limbs like wrath in death and envy afterwards. We all stand up against the spirit of Caesar, and in the spirit of men there is no blood. Oh, that we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar, but alas, Caesar must bleed for it. And gentle friends, let's kill him boldly. But not wrathfully, which so appearing to the common eyes we shall be called purgers, not murderers. 
And for Mark Antony, think not of him, for he can do no more than Caesar's arm when Caesar's head is off. Our heaven and our earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help, ho, oh, they murder Caesar. Servant, go bid the priests do present sacrifice. Bring me the opinions of their success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threatened me ne'er looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. Caesar shall go forth. My lord. What say the augurers? They would not have you to stir forth this day. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in this house and not your own. Mark Antony shall say I am not well. And for thy humor, I will stay at home. Ah, here's Decius. He shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. And you're coming very happy time to bear my greeting to the Senators and tell them that I will not come today. But now you know, the Senate hath concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you will send them word you will not come, their minds may change. If Caesar hide himself, shall they not whisper, Lo, Caesar is afraid? <laughs> How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia. I am ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. <laughs> Good morrow, Caesar. Welcome, Cassius. What, Brutus, are you stirred so early too? If it will please Caesar to be so good to Caesar as to hear me, beware the Ides of March. The Ides of March are come. Aye, Caesar, but not gone. What, is this fellow mad? Sir, I give place. Nay, nay, let him speak. Oh, the soothsayer. Look how he makes to Caesar. Mark him, I fear our purpose is discovered. Casca be sudden, for we fear prevention. Are we all ready? What is now amiss that Caesar and his Senate must redress? Theseus, Casca, Cassius. Now, speak hands for me! And you, Brutus. Oh, what is this? Great Caesar has been stabbed! Liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead! Run heads proclaim! Pray it upon the streets! Romans! Romans, countrymen and lovers, hear me for my cause, and be silent that you may hear. Silence! I will hear Brutus speak. The noble Brutus is ascended. Silence! Silence! If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend to Caesar, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. Yeah. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any speak for him, I have offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any speak for him, I have offended. Who is here so vile who would not love his country? If any speak for him, I have offended. I pause for a reply. <laughs> Here comes Mark Antony. Though he had no hand in Caesar's death, he shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not. Welcome, Mark Antony. O mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Fare thee well. 
I hope that you should give me reasons why and wherein Caesar was dangerous. Our reasons are so full of good regard that were you, Antony, the son of Caesar, you should be satisfied. That's all I seek. And am, moreover, suitor that I may speak in the order of his funeral. You shall, Mark Antony. Oh. Brutus, Brutus, a word with you. You know not what you do. Do not consent that Antony speak in his funeral. He speaks by leave and by permission. And that we are contented Caesar shall have all true rites and lawful ceremonies. It shall advantage us more than do us wrong. I know not what may fall. I like it not. Good countrymen, let me depart alone and for my sake stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace his speech tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. <laughs> Gentle Romans, peace ho! Let us hear him! Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault. And grievously has Caesar answered it. Here, under the leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. <sighs> Methinks there is much reason in his saying. Caesar has had great wrong. Yeah, Caesar would not take the crown, therefore it's certain he was not ambitious. Now mark him, he begins to speak again. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, then I will wrong such honorable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. Yeah. Traitors! Villains! Murderers! Honorable men! Oh, woeful day! We will Good friends! Friend. Sweet friends! Let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator as Brutus is, but as you know me all, a plain, blunt man that love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right out. I tell you that which yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony, would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny! Take what cost thou will. Antony, seizing on this moment of riot and disorder, formed a triumvirate with the boyish Octavius Caesar and the scapegoat Lepidus. 
they joined their legions and marched in search of the only threat existing to their power, the rallied armies of Brutus and Cassius. <laughs> Cassius, I have here received letters that young Octavius and Mark Antony come down upon us with a mighty power, bending their expedition toward Philippi. Myself have letters of the selfsame tenor. What do you think of marching to Philippi presently? I do not think it good. You have a reason? This it is. Tis better that the enemy seek us. So shall he waste his means, weary his soldiers, doing himself offense, whilst we, lying still, are full of rest, defense, and nimbleness. Good reasons must, of course, give place to better. The people between Philippi and this ground do stand but in a forced affection, for they have grudged us contribution. The enemy, marching along by them, by them shall make a fuller number up, come on refreshed, new added, and encouraged. From which advantage we shall cut him off, if at Philippi we do face him there, these people at our back. Mm. Then with your will, go on. We'll along ourselves and meet them at Philippi. When this news reached the rival camp. Oh, what message comes? Prepare your generals. The enemy comes in gallant show. Their bloody sign of battle is hung out and something to be done immediately. They stand and would have parley. Mark Antony, shall we give sign of battle? No, Octavius. We will answer on their charge. Make forth. The generals would have some words. Words before blows. Is it so, countrymen? Not that we love words better. As you do. Good words are better than bad strokes, Octavius. In your bad strokes, Brutus, you give good words. Witness the hole you made in Caesar's heart, crying, long live, hail Caesar. Come, come, the cause. If arguing make us sweat, the proof it will turn to redder drops. Look, I draw a sword against conspirators. When think you that the sword goes up again? Never, till Caesar's three and thirty wounds be well avenged. Come, Antony, away. Defiance, traitors, hurry in your teeth. If you dare fight today, come to the field. I perceive but cold demeanor in Octavius's wing. Sudden push gives them the overthrow. Ride, soldiers. Let them all come down. So saying, Brutus launches an impetuous charge. But though the legions of his foe Octavius are surrounded, his ally Cassius is left unguarded on his flank and open to attack. Mark Antony sees the opportunity and surrounds outnumbered Cassius. Top a hill from which the carnage may be overlooked, Cassius watches and gives way to despair. Begging his servant hold his sword, he throws himself upon its point and dies. But word of this sad news is brought to Brutus. He succumbs to all the haunting fears of conscience which have nagged him since that fateful day. The Ides of March. Oh, Julius Caesar, thou art mighty yet. Thy spirit walks abroad and turns our swords in our own proper entrails. Fly, fly, my lord, there is no tarrying here. Peace, my countrymen. My heart doth joy that yet in all my life I found no man but he was true to me. I shall have glory by this living day, more than Octavius and Mark Antony by this vile conquest shall attain unto. Fly, my lord, fly! Hence I will follow. My pretty straight old, stay by thy lord. Thou art a fellow of good respect, and thy life hath had some smatch of honor in it. Hold then my sword, and turn away thy face while I do run upon it. Wilt thou, straight old, give me your hand first? Fare you well, my lord. Farewell, good straight old. Ah! Caesar! Now be still. I killed not thee with half so good a will. This was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators, save only he, did what they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him 
that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. This is Tom Tully again. Family theater is dedicated to the homes of our nation, and therefore to our nation, because a nation is, after all, only a family of families. And a family is a little nation in itself. The major virtues of one are the major virtues of the other. A strong, enduring nation is one that has those very virtues which can make a family survive all the evil attacks which can be launched against it. These virtues are solidarity and unity the kind of solidarity and unity which comes from respect for one another, a common desire for the right and good, a sense of the personal dignity of every one of God's creatures. So one's love of one's country begins at home, in one's own home. The beginning is with kindness and charity and respect for each member of the family. As John Henry Newman once put it, we fulfill the injunction to love all men by the act of loving those nearest to us. Every fine family is a contribution to the nation as a whole. The nation that prays together will remain strong and united, just as the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood Family Theater has brought you Gene Raymond and Wendell Corey in William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar with Tom Tully as your host and narrator. Others in our cast were Tudor Owen, Raymond Burr, Howard McNear, Bill Lally, Bob Cole, Stan Waxman, Charlotte Fletcher, and Don Doolittle. The script was adapted by Vern Driscoll with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by J.F. Mansfield. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Gene Baker expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week at this time when Family Theater will present William Lundigan in The Black Tulip. Join us, won't you? <laughs> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>